Well, good evening to you. I hope that you had a pleasant afternoon and a good day, and I hope that continues on into the evening and a good night's rest and a good day tomorrow. Most of you are aware that we have started a new series of lessons in the Sunday morning class. We're going to talk about the parables of Jesus for a while. And it occurred to me that since that is the case, perhaps it would be appropriate for me to do something this evening that in some way related to that study. In fact, one of the things that you and I really don't have a good frame of reference for is hearing a parable that we don't know the meaning of. When we were growing up, as we were studying the scriptures, of course, we didn't know exactly what all that meant, but we kind of had been taught through the years, and now every parable that we hear, when we, we at least know we've heard it before, and we don't have a real sense of mystery about well, what in the world is being taught here. Well, I, I just think that's not right. So I, I'll see if I can give you a little mystery to, to, to grapple with here at the beginning of the lesson, and we'll, and we'll go from there. Uh, I'm going to share with you a parable, a modern-day parable, called the parable of the five farmers. And it goes like this. Once there were five farmers who each had set aside a little patch of ground near their house to plant some vegetables. They decided they could save some money if they all went in together and bought one very large bag of seed. They just divided up amongst themselves. The seed that they purchased together was reported to be of the highest quality and highest purity possible. So they divided the bag amongst themselves, and then each of them went and planted the seed. Each farmer planted the seed that they bought together. That's the only thing that each farmer planted. A few months later, each farmer was blessed with a good crop. They, they met to talk about their results, and the first farmer reported he had a, just the most beautiful crop of lettuce you'd ever seen. The second farmer was a little surprised at what he said and thought maybe the first guy was funning with him because he said, well, he had a good crop too, but his was spinach. The third farmer is really starting to get a little mystified. Here he says, something's wrong. You guys are just pulling our leg because I got coriander. And the fourth and fifth farmers were equally surprised because they had grown dill and carrots respectively. And at this point, if this was something the Lord Jesus was telling, he would say this, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, think about those poor folks in New Testament days. <laughs> They'd hear a parable, and the Lord would say, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. They wouldn't get an explanation. I'm going to give you an explanation. <laughs> but imagine how they would receive this teaching. I'm sure they would want to hear more. And, of course, that's part of it, I suppose. But anyway, let's think about some possible explanations. How, how this could happen, that five guys using the same bag of seed, end up with five different crops. How is that possible? Well, suppose, just suppose, although the, the claim was that this was the, the highest quality seed, maybe the, what the farmers bought wasn't really pure. Maybe what they bought was a bag that had been sitting back in the seed warehouse. That had been, they'd been using it to dump waste seed in it or, or seed that was left over. They didn't sell a whole bag. They had a little bit left. They just dump it in this bag. And so maybe, just maybe, in that bag that they bought, there was sort of five layers of different seed in there. And when they each got their portion out, they got one layer at a time. And so mostly they each got five different seeds. Now, I'm not saying that's very likely. <laughs> that's a kind of a far-fetched explanation. But I suppose, you know, it's, it's one thing we might think about. Well, maybe, maybe this could have happened. Maybe unbeknownst to the farmers, maybe their wives had already planted some other things in that little patch of ground near the house. And the farmers didn't know about that, but this had been planted a little while earlier. It had already taken root. And so when the farmers planted their seed, well, that other seed that already was well along just kind of choked out the fresh seed that had been planted there. I suppose that's possible. Again, I'm not quite sure how likely that is. And, and maybe also it's just possible that although the farmers claimed to use only the seed that they had bought together, maybe... Just maybe some of them, maybe at least four of them, didn't use just that seed, but they used seed from some other source. And that's why the crops were different. None of those explanations are terribly satisfying, actually, but let's just explain the parable. The bag of seed, as you might expect, knowing a little bit about the parables, as I'm sure you do, is the Word of God. And the farmers are the religious teachers of our day. 
The fields are the places where they preach or teach. And of course, the crops then would be the results of their teaching. You see, just about all religious teachers who accept the Bible as the Word of God claim that there's where they take their teaching from. They take it from the Bible. Their teaching is based on the Word of God. But it is also clear to anyone who has eyes to see and ears to hear that their seed produces different results. These different folks who all claim to take their teaching straight from the Bible, some of that produces Methodists and some Baptists and some Lutherans and some Catholics and some <coughs> Presbyterians and some this and some that. And just as in the case of the farmers then, we might wonder, how can that be? How can we take the same seed and plant it and get different kinds of crops out of it? Well, let's think about some of the things that we talked about in terms of how it could happen with the literal seed in the patch of field by the house. Maybe the seed isn't pure. Maybe that's part of the problem here. Well, in this case, the seed is the Word of God. And so are we really asking that question? Is, is the Word of God, the seed that is the Word of God, is it really pure? Well, it certainly claims that it is. In Psalm 12 and verse 6, we have these words. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. Or think about those words from Psalm 19, <coughs> verses 7 and 9, with which we might be somewhat familiar. Psalm 19, starting in verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. There's nothing wrong with the seed. There's nothing wrong with the seed that is the Word of God. It is pure seed. It does exactly what God wanted it to do. In fact, in Psalm 119 and verse 140, the psalmist says, Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. And notice what Peter says about this in 1 Peter chapter 1, and starting in verse 23. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The word of God is pure and unadulterated. And in the Bible, when men responded to that pure word of God, when that seed was sown in their hearts, those who responded to it became Christians. That's the crop. That's the result of that seed. James tells us in James 1 and verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Seed produces Christians. That's what it does. Now, people who have responded to the word of truth and who believe and teach and practice the same things. And someone might point out, but even in the New Testament, there were different churches. There was the church in Corinth, and there was the church in Ephesus, and there was the church in the churches of Galatia. There were all kinds of churches, but, but they were not denominations. They were local congregations of the one church that Jesus built. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17, Paul says, For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul says wherever he went, he taught the same things. Let me ask you a question. Could a man from one of the religious denominations today go to any church and teach the same things and be received there just as equally well? Paul said that's what he did. He taught the same things in every church. That's not the case today. A man's teaching would not be welcome in every church, only in those where it was the same religious thought and same religious belief and practice. Well, the seed produces Christians. One church. So the diversity of results that we see in the religious world, all claiming to come from the same seed, it's not because of the seed. There's nothing wrong with the seed. We have to look for an answer somewhere else. Well, what about this? Maybe even though most religious teachers claim that they 
use the same seed, that all of their teaching comes from the same source, maybe there are some things in the hearts of those who listen there already that might choke out that word. Just like we said that the wise might have planted seed before the farmers did and their, their previous plants might choke out the seed that was planted later. Maybe, maybe that's the kind of thing that we're seeing here. And, and there might be some truth to that because there are things that will choke out the word that we can think of. A tradition is one of those things. And the verses there in Matthew chapter 15 and verses 1 through 6, uh, there the Lord simply tells them, you know, you, you've made void the word of God by your tradition. You, you've decided that this is something that ought to be done, even though the commandment of God tells you to do something else. And, and, and so here are people who claim to be religious rulers, people who understand the law, who keep the law perfectly, and yet... Here's a clear command from God that they're not keeping because of their tradition. Well, whatever I have, I've set it aside to God, and so I can't use it to help my parents with it. It was the tradition that made the Word of God void in this situation. For, for a modern-day example, consider a, a religious group. They, they believe in baptism, but it doesn't have to be by burial. It can be by sprinkling or pouring. They think that's okay. That's still baptism. And then imagine a theological student who's been reading in his Bible. He's familiar with what his group teaches, but he's been reading in his Bible in Romans chapter 6. Go over in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, the first five verses. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now here is this, this poor theological student He's reading this verse, these verses here. And he reads and he says, well, that, that seems pretty clear that baptism is a burial. And I know that the, the early church, when the church first began, whenever they baptized people, they always did so by immersing them in water, which fits in with this picture here pretty well. But that's not what we believe. And so he goes and he talks to one of his religious teachers. And he says, can you explain this to me? I, I don't understand. Can, can we see how... A preconceived idea or an erroneous idea about something that we think is true can, can hurt our ability to understand the clear word of God when we see it here. We, we read what it says, but that, that doesn't mesh with what we think is right. With the whole time, it's the thing that we thought that was right that's the wrong thing because the word of God is not going to be wrong. It's going to be right. The creeds of men are a thing that can choke out the Word of God. A creed is a statement of belief. As an example, I've taken a small excerpt, a uh, statement from the Methodist creed. I'm not trying to pick on the Methodists at all. I, I, this is a, a thing, the statement here, that lots and lots of denominations believe today. Uh, Wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. We are justified by faith only. And yet, imagine someone who believes that, who has accepted that as true because this is what they have been taught. And then they look in Mark 16 and verses 15 and 16. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And then also James 2 and verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So here's someone who has accepted this, the thought of this creed that we're justified by faith only, by faith alone. He's reading in James chapter 2, he gets to verse 24 and he reads these words. What is he going to think? That doesn't, that doesn't go right. That, 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 that's not what we believe. What does that mean? It, it's harder for him to understand the scripture because of something he already <laughs> has in his heart. In fact, I would suggest to you that even the, the very acceptance of the concept of denominationalism itself is a thing that can choke out the word. This idea that, that this is a, a way to please God, that is something that God accepts. Look, if you would, in John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, 
God's Word clearly teaches that God's people should be one religiously. John 17, starting in verse 20. As Jesus is praying to His Father in heaven, He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in Me through their Word, that they may all be one, even as You, Father, are in Me and I in You, and that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that You sent Me. One, united, believing the same things, teaching the same things, practicing the same things. And yet, today, people are told, well, just go to whichever church you think is a good one for you. Just go to the church of your choice. Where you go doesn't really matter as long as you go somewhere. That's what's important. And I will say to you that even people who aren't terribly religious, maybe people who have thought about being religious, who, 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 who have an, a little bit of an interest in finding God, they can look at this situation and see that it can't possibly be right. That there's so much division, so much difference of thought about what the Bible actually teaches. A lot of people who aren't affiliated with any religious group can look at this and see that this situation cannot be from God. So maybe there are some things that could choke out the word, and we know that there are. And also, consider what Paul says here. I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there will be no divisions among you, but you to be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. That, that's, that's what the seed is intended to produce. And if it doesn't produce that, then we have to look for an answer somewhere else. Well, maybe the answer is this. Maybe the religious teaching, even though it is claimed that it is coming only from the Word of God, maybe it is coming from some other source. And we don't like to think that. We like to think that people, when they say they teach just from the Bible, that that's what they do. But we almost are forced to conclude that that's not the case because where is the authority in the Word of God, in the seed? Where is the authority for salvation by faith alone? We've already looked at a verse that teaches exactly the opposite of that, James 2, verse 24. Where is the authority for sprinkling or pouring for baptism? We've already looked at Romans chapter 6. Where is the authority for something like instrumental music? In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, it's clear that Christians are told to sing. There's no command, there's no authority for the use of instruments in the worship. Where's the authority for all the different kinds of church organizations that we see here and there and, and things that we could talk about probably for the rest of the night, which might not be all that profitable for us. The truth is, in Matthew 15 and verse 13, every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. These ideas of men that have led to organizations of men, that have led to churches of men, these are things that are not going to last. They are going to be uprooted. And in fact, we're also told in Psalm 127 and verse 1, unless the Lord builds the plant, unless He builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. The seed is intended to produce one kind of thing. And if it doesn't, it's not the fault of the seed. The fault is somewhere else. It's with the men who are teaching it or the source of their teaching or the people who are hearing it who already have their preconceived ideas. It's somewhere else. Well, let me, let me just ask you to think about a hypothetical situation. What if, what if we could get preachers from three different religious denominations to agree to hold an evangelistic meeting. All three of these guys are going to hold a joint evangelistic meeting. And in order to do this, what they're all going to agree to do is they're going to agree to put aside their denominational differences. They're not going to teach on anything that is particular to their denomination. They're only going to preach lessons. They're only going to teach classes that relate to exactly what the Bible says. Not teach on anything where they can't find a clear word of authority for what the Bible says. That's one thing they're going to agree to do. The second thing they're going to agree to do is, is if, if there are responses from people who hear these lessons and they obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, then those converts, whoever or how many ever there might be, they're going to be free to join whatever group they want to join. 
And so, they, so we have this meeting. I mean, three, let's get three famous guys. Three famous guys, they all agree to do this. We hire this huge hall. All these people come. I mean, these are three pretty well-known guys who are doing the preaching. The people come from miles around to hear it. And all they hear, all they hear is what comes straight from the Bible. None of the denominational differences, none of the other things that we can't find authority for in the Word of God, just what comes from the Bible. And let's suppose further that there are converts. People hear this teaching and this preaching, and, and what they hear moves them to, to believe what the Word of God says, and they repent of their sins, and they're baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the question. I know it's a hypothetical situation. But here's the question. To what denomination then would these converts belong? They, they wouldn't belong to any denomination. They would just be Christians. Well, suppose then that these folks decided amongst themselves, we don't want to join any denomination. We would rather just kind of keep meeting together. Could they do that? and still be pleasing to God? Could they do that and still be forgiven of their sins? Could they do that and still have done everything that God wants men to do in order to be His people? The answer is yes. These folks could still be pleasing to God and, and would be pleasing to God if they continued in the Word, growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, learning how to be what God wants them to be in this life, teaching other people about the things that they've learned. These people could please the Lord just by following the teaching of the Bible. And of course, that is what we try to do. That's exactly what we try to do. We, we've talked about parables a little bit off and on all day long, I guess. But let me suggest something to you. Although Jesus did teach in parables a lot, he also frequently spoke very plainly and very directly. And I will tell you that some of the Lord's clearest and most straightforward teaching is this. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. There's nothing figurative about that. It's a plain statement. Very clear and plain teaching in the Bible that says, if we want to be pleasing to God, if we want to have the forgiveness of our sins, we must come to Him in faith, we must turn away from our sins, and we must be baptized to have that forgiveness. This is the Word of God, and this is what it teaches us. And if we can help you to obey it, then of course we'd be thrilled to have that opportunity. Maybe there are people here tonight who, as Christians, are not what they ought to be, and maybe you know that there's something that you need to do to change your life. If I could encourage you in any way to do that this evening, to make a decision that you're going to set something aside, that you're going to repent of some sin, that you're going to do what you've got to do to make things right between you and God, then please, I, I, I want to do that. <laughs> don't let another moment go by without doing that. If you're a child of God, don't let another moment go by with this thing hanging over your head that you know God disapproves of. But if there's some kind of public statement you need to make or request you need to make, then of course this invitation is for you. So if you need to obey the gospel to become a simple Christian, the kind of fruit that is produced by the seed, by the word of God, if you need to turn away from your sins and be restored to faithfulness, then please come while we stand and while we sing.